let's get it out of the way. Possibly Taliot, possibly Taliot. Pick one. I have long since ceased caring and no amount of comments will make me feel otherwise, so go yell to your mum or nursery teacher if you're still in need of attention. Some groundwork. I am not a fellow of the Royal Society of, I don't know, whichever Royal Society would be into this. Average guy, above average enthusiasm for ancient history. Blame Age of Empires, I guess. So with a finite amount of time and research materials available to us, this video is not going to be a spectacular scholarly discourse on the prehistory of the Balearic Isles, but it will be a pretty good glimpse of some of the main Taliotic sites on Majorca and Menorca. Not all, as you'd already know if you saw the two episodes previous, we had ballpark two and a half days on each island to get around almost everything. And exploring the Taliotic site is an incredible treat for a bunch of reasons. This is a culture almost entirely doing its own thing, at least architecturally, despite the well-connected nature of the Mediterranean, yet it's never talked about in the same breath as the other cultures contemporary at the time. This is the Phoenicians, Greeks, take your pick. And yet there is so much to see. Most of the time, if there's not much discourse about a culture, it's because there's a finite amount of remains to visit or put in museums or get people excited about. But look at this, and this, and this, and they're right there in the middle of the landscape, standing at four, five plus meters tall, and there's loads to visit and admire and get excited about. And going to tempt fate here, at time of writing, there's really not much content on YouTube about this. Maybe that's just English-speaking YouTube, I don't know. But it's nice to shine a spotlight on a culture that goes almost unmentioned when we talk about the ancient Mediterranean world. And look, based on footfall that Mallorca and Menorca get in an average year, they are not hard to get to. We already did the practical side of all of this on our travel episodes, which, you know, click wherever they are on the screen right now. But it's not like we're on some remote Pacific island that gets one boat journey every three months. The Balearic Isles are dead cheap to get to, and it's not like this stuff is a secret when you get there, hence why I'm kind of puzzled there isn't more content out there. So based on the footage we have, the best thing we can offer is a guide to a selection of the sites you can visit, and while we're at it, we can sprinkle in some of the history. We're going to go through these in the order we visited them. There's no real significance to this order other than, well, it's not an unreasonable sequence to see them by car. Okay, so Majorca. We got out of Palma and bisected pretty much the whole island to start up here, just by the town of Arta. Now this is a good first site, it's Se Passe. Um, it, this is one of the main things that makes exploring Taliotic sites so exciting. While some of them are essentially just one monument, a lot of these sites are entire ruined villages where you can walk amongst all sorts of different structures and multi-purpose buildings. I mean, I get it. To the casual viewer, something like this, or maybe this, doesn't look like much to get excited about. But okay, the odds are good that if you've clicked on this video, you might have done a bit of exploring of ancient sites. If you haven't, I just need to take a moment to really underline this. If you ever go hunting for Roman stuff in England, for example, you sometimes get this, but more often this, or even just this. And this is the Romans we're talking about, not to mention that these structures might be, you know, give or take a thousand years sooner than the Taliotic culture. Back to the Balearic Isles, and here is just all of this, just so much that you can see on the ground of everyday buildings. And a lot of these places have structures surviving pretty much at height. So look, people, appreciate what we've got here. As far as extant masonry more than 2,000 years old, this is luxury mode. Okay, so say passe. What's here? Well, there's the monumental gateway as you enter. The walls are believed to be a later addition to the site. They've been dated somewhere between 650 to 540 BC, which is at least a few hundred years later than the central Taliot or many of the other structures. Founding of the settlement is put around 900 to 800 BC, though it's believed the central Taliot came first and might have been even earlier, the earliest estimates being around 1100 BC. Um, adjacent to that, we've got the Hippostyle Room, this is why I probably wouldn't get very far in serious historic circles. I have to suppress a giggle when I say the word hippostyle. It just means a structure where the roof is supported by pillars. That's all. There's other outlying structures which are a little harder to interpret just by seeing what's left on the ground. 
not to whinge, but one of the really difficult things about filming sites like this, where there's lots of loose rubble and stones, is that visually, it's like TV static. When you're actually there, you can walk around a bit and that allows you to gauge depth and gives you the perspective information that your eyes need to properly distinguish one shape from another. But when this gets baked flat into a video, no amount of pixels will stop these images from being pretty visually cluttered to the eye. I don't know, just keep that in mind. It's one of the things that makes filming sites like this difficult. Now, we can't go much further without a sidebar on Taliots in general. So Taliot is the name for these striking towers that are found on Mallorca and especially Menorca where you can barely go 100 yards without tripping over one. Here's the main thing that will surprise and confuse you. The bottom line is we do not know the exact role of the Taliots. Now let me say that one more time. Despite the fact that we have ample sites to explore and examine and you can clearly see that they all have striking similarities to each other, we still can't place if they are religious, domestic, military, all three or none of the above. And look, to the casual observer, I know that seems baffling, like what, how has this not been cracked yet? But look, this sort of, I guess, academic agnosticism that you often get in archeology, span this is a good thing. It means people are working really hard on pulling in an absolute wealth of knowledge from across disciplines, and we have a suitably nuanced picture that defies a simple one sentence explanation. Be wary of simplistic rushes to a conclusion. Flipping back to Say Passe, for example, this is a Taliot that doesn't seem to have a central pillar, which many others do. The characteristics of this Taliot just doesn't make it suitable for either defense or as a practical home. And if it was just a big storage silo, for example, we'd probably be able to find scraps of that, whatever it was, grains, fruits, rare Pokemon cards. We just don't see it in the archeology. span so yes, this is why I have to attach a lot of caveats and verbal asterisks to what we say on the subject of Taliots, as leaning too hard on one interpretation when the evidence just isn't there, that's sloppy. What can we say? Well, okay, on a very basic level, people often point out that the vantage point that the Taliots offer gives you a clear strategic advantage over the surrounding countryside. And I mean, it's certainly useful to have the view. And yeah, I mean, that's a pretty imposing structure you've got there that can be seen for, well, some distance at least. There's also the suggestion that it was something that brought the community together, which, you know, an ambitious construction like this undoubtedly would. I mean... <laughs> It's an awful lot of work for a team building exercise. And I mean, do you really need hundreds of these to do that? But yeah, it's definitely a status symbol for the community. Anyway, yeah, in a lot of ways, it's kind of inexplicable. Just resist the urge to lean too hard on one explanation, like they're all definitely military towers or all of them are storage centers. One of the reasons there's no slam dunk on what these are, while they look similar, there's significant differences in their construction and it appears that many might have served multiple purposes at different times. On the Balearic Isles there was quite a lot of seasonal movement, particularly of the agricultural communities, so at different times it might have been a storage or it might have been left abandoned or empty, we're not entirely sure. Uh, we've got this far and we still haven't made it past Say Passe yet. The next few we visited on Mallorca are somewhat less complex. Son Coro? Okay, this one is pretty unlike any other sites on the islands. Perched on the edge of some farmer's fields, what at first glance looks like some Easter Island vibes. And look, it has to be said, it's a reconstruction. So there's always the asterisk of this might not be accurate. It's described as a sanctuary, and it's actually from a later period than most of the Taliotic sites we'll be seeing. This is after the 500s BC, which is generally referred to as the post-Taliotic period. There's more outside influence on the islands, particularly from the Carthaginians. And so what you could be seeing here is a newer form of religious expression. So the footprint of the site is in a horseshoe shape and we believe it was a hippostyle building. So the upright pillar configuration does make sense, but yes, these are pillar fragments that were found in the area and it's just kind of assumed that this is how they were. There's a particular noteworthy collection of finds from the site in the form of three bull heads that are on display in the National Museum in Madrid. Next along, and not far away, is Son Fred. Okay, so this is a Taliot, and it's in a good state of preservation. A lot of the sites we went to, like Say Passe, had a Taliot in the middle with remains of other structures radiating out. But in some cases, you just have the Taliot visible, and Son Fred stands a pretty impressive five meters high, at least in parts. 
this is probably the best time to talk about the diversity you see in Taliotic Towers. So Sonfred has this low entrance that you can duck through. It's not so low that you have to crawl or anything, and it has a central pillar. The boards on site and elsewhere have these interpretations of how the roofs might have worked, but later you're going to see some Taliots that aren't hollow. They have a solid core, and it's possible that Sonfred was used for storage. We have evidence from the site of legumes and cereal grains, but yep, here it is again. We're really not sure about usage. Better get used to it. There's the tantalizing detail. There appears to have been a fire here sometime around 500 BC. That's at a time of transition where new Taliots weren't being built anymore. And after the fire, habitation appears to have ended. But exactly what this fire was, whether it's just an accident or whether it is the result of hostilities, we're just simply not sure. Next along, another Taliot that pretty much stands on its own. It's the Taliot of Binifat. By the way, quite apart from my anglicized attempts at Catalan, don't feel like there's too much ancient significance to these names. Into modern times, they're generally just named after whoever's farm they happen to be sitting on. So at a glance, it looks quite similar to Sonfred. Unlike the right-angled entrance to Sonfred, this has a straight passage into the centre. It doesn't have a central pillar, but it's believed that it might have at one point. Either this was removed, or it might have been made of perishable materials. <laughs> couldn't really get all of this in frame at once without just spinning this way and that until I give everyone a migraine. So the last three we mentioned are all within a pretty small radius of each other. Kind of in the dead center of Mallorca, there are other sites near this cluster that we didn't get time for. But still, while we're in the central part of the island, a site that is probably jostling with Se Passe for first place, I think Son Fornes probably does take the coveted if you only visit one Taliotic site trophy mainly because at Se Passe, the trees that have covered the site make it a little harder to get the full view of the place, whereas Son Fornes, you can clearly see the footprint of the settlement, and it's quite something. First thing first, two Taliots in a good state of preservation. There's this one to the northwest with a straight entrance and this central pillar, and then there's this one to the southeast. The northwest Taliot is pretty impressively preserved, about four meters in height at most, it's pretty massive. Again, I know no one's here for filming insights, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's very hard to get a decently composed shot when you're inside the Taliots because you've got no way to sort of back up and fit everything you want in. So instead, we're back to spinning shots that make everyone feel sick. We did say that Taliots differed in design, and even these two, like 20 yards from each other, are different. The southeast Taliot doesn't have this entrance passage and would have probably been accessed through the roof. Now, we're not going to go into the specific aspects of every domestic building here, but the amount of structures and features visible is fantastic. And the site has quite a lengthy occupation. There were people here continually during the Roman period too. We've got just one more site to get to on Mallorca, and this is probably my favorite, not least because the sun had finally come out. We actually ended up using most of the footage of this on the Mallorca travel episode, but how could we not? It's the gorgeous necropolis of Son Real. It's mostly post taliotic though its earliest parts from about the 600s BC. As a rough rule, the circular ones are the oldest, the naviform ones from about the 400s BC, and the square ones are the latest from sort of 300s to no 100s BC. And since we're casually slipping the word naviform into conversation, that simply means boat-shaped. Before the cultures here started building taliots, they were all about naviform structures, whether that's to live in or to bury people in. Now, the interpretation at Son Real is that while these naviform graves are centuries after the last naviform structures were being built on the islands, this could signify the islanders attempting to identify themselves with the past or past traditions. Across all of the graves, the average is about two meters in diameter. Uh, based on the finds, it's believed that these were begun as high status burials, but this appears to slip somewhat over time. Still, there's quite a diversity of burial types. Sometimes it's one body, sometimes it's up to six in one construction. If this all sounds like a lot of generalities, that's because the number of burials here is dense. Just look at this diagram. That's why we're having to summarize. In fact, that's sort of emblematic of these trips. This is just a short summary of Taliots on Mallorca. But you can see, of the known Taliotic sites on the island, this is a fraction. However, pretty content that we got a good vertical slice of what there is to see. Many of those dots will have only the tiniest bit of concealed masonry, or quite possibly nothing at all to see for the casual visitor. 
Sad that we couldn't fit in Capo Corp Vel, uh, which would have given us some nice examples of square talions, but obviously there's others. As we already said up top, we had about 60 hours on Mallorca in winter, so limited daylight hours to fit in what we could. But if you thought the density of Taliotic sites on Mallorca was intense, have a look at Menorca. It's probably for the best that we laid out most of the groundwork for this episode, as we'll have more than double the number of sites to get through on Menorca. So catch us next time for that. Hope you've enjoyed this little experiment where we focus more on the historical side. We've been making travel content for a while, but either way, this channel also doubles as a way to get our music out. We produce all the music you've been hearing on these episodes, and the Taliotic EP is now on Bandcamp.com. If you want to support the channel, that's the place to do it. Otherwise, we'll catch you soon for part two on Menorca. Thank you.